It was early spring. 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 It
1976. Recorded Q Rowan with John Greaves, Lisa Herman, Kidnapped My Father. Got married. Everyone got does divorced. it. I just got caught. 1982. Moved back to London. 1914. Recorded set up Naked business, Shakespeare. Breeding pedigree dogs with Sid Stahl. 1984. Recorded Nights Like bred This. Sphinx, which only lived moved for three back weeks. to New York. No photographs exist. Joined Laughed Golden out of Palominos. the 18th Congress of the Society of Social got Scientists. Married. After moved revelations back to London. in the gutter press. Recorded downtown in 1988. Recorded King Strut and other stories. Sold elixirs, tonics, antidotes to my nine brothers in return for their lunch money. So, what does Peter Blakeman eat for breakfast? Keats said it. The war, the deeds, the disappointment, the anxiety, imagination struggle, the subtle food to make us feel existence and to show how quiet death is. Yeah, you're going to get called really cynical about the meantime. It's a nasty little tune. Yeah, well, I am cynical. <laughs> um, meantime... Yes, yes, I don't know what to say about that. I think it was based on uh, my fantasy of life in the Eastern Bloc before the events of Christmas 89, when the wall went down. Life has a throat, we learn to grab it That kind of thing comes automatic In a zone like the one we inhabit In the meantime Ten of us share one pair of shoes No one dares to air their views On the square of the hypotenuse In the meantime in the meantime, life goes on, ticking like a meantime bomb, and stories all start once upon a meantime. They melt old locomotives down to cast a vast black iron crown to symbolize what weighs them down. Ghost train pulls into the hub and off. No one gets on, no one gets off. But you can hear the ghost conductor call. Say all aboard for the meantime. Yeah, the meantime has a strange allure. It looks so good in the brochure. You could hold up there, you could take the cure. Oh, sure. Wait forever Mean times never right Only blues More bad news Coming down the pipe Mean times never On your side If you're late Mean time can wait Mean time and mean time I sent a card to the folks back home A picture of a burning aerodrome It came back stamped, address unknown I was alone in the meantime And the iodine kid killed his iodine wife And they gave him 50 years to life Now he scrapes the days on a wall with a knife He knows what it means to do meantime And in the meantime life goes on Ticking like a meantime bomb And stories all start once upon a meantime Yes, in the meantime life goes on Ticking like a meantime bomb Stories all start once upon a meantime
try to think of your first musical memory. Oh, great, yeah, that's no problem. My mother had an old harmonium that she bought from the Salvation Army that used to stand in the drawing room there. And on hot summer days, you have to draw the curtains against the sun coming in through the windows, and the place would bake like an oven. And the uh, Salvation Ar Harmonium, Salvation Army Harmonium used to stand there. And I used to begin playing that as a kid. And I realized that if I put words to the sounds coming out of that machine, I could have power over the girls in the neighborhood. It happened. I saw it. It would fall down, pull up their dresses, and spin on their heads like breaker dancers. They could be a block away, but they'd hear this stuff. And then I understood that there were certain words that I was singing that offended God. So at a very early age, I recognized that language has an amazing power. Even though I was six years old, with the curtains drawn, what I was saying offended the supreme autocrat endlessness, His Majesty, God. So, obviously, there was something to explore there, so I never looked back. I've been writing songs ever since then. songs and I sang them. I, I made records. Made records? What was your last album called? Uh, King Strut and Other Stories, Your Majesty. Was it any good? Well, the stories were fiction, but they were true. But what will you do with your first million dollars? I still haven't written the song that will make the listener feel like Will Keller, a Kansas farmer, did in 1928 when he dared peek out of his storm cellar as a tornado passed over. Above him was the hollow vortex, 50 to 100 feet across, its walls lit by zigzag lightning flashes. Smaller vortexes were forming inside the main one and emitting hissing noises as they broke free of it. I still haven't written that song. Yeah, it took me a while to figure out that that was probably a song about my anxieties on becoming a father for the first time. The chicken in the sack is obviously a symbol for the babe in the womb, and the woman throws... Uh, what does she do? Oh, she transforms the husband in some way, um, throws him down a well where he emerges like he's born, but missing his symbolically phallic little finger. It's all you know, clear as day, I'm sure, to most Freudians. Find your wife 
When the sack hits the water, it comes to life. The woman takes the handle and she turns the crank. Up comes the bucket and there sits Frank. He says there's only one thing I don't understand. He says where's the little finger on my left hand? I love bad salads, I mean sad ballads. Stories of love, death, violence, and the supernatural. The more tragic, the better. The words to chicken are influenced by that sort of thing. And Shirt and Comb is really an attempt to write a tragic 18th century love ballad. You know, ah, uh, that my love were in my arms and I in my bed again, that sort of thing. Don't take volunteers But there's one thing to you I swear Though I may be gone for years I swear no shirt shall ever touch my skin no comb go through my hair But I think of the bed you're in And wish that I were lying with you there June 1990 I'll be 39 in August At a point in my life when some at least of my youthful dreams have become realities I'm startlingly tall Only a few inches short of freak stature The massive escarpment of my nose, which juts from my profile like a blunt rudder, is my most distinctive feature. Along with a weak mouth and chin and the too close proximity of my eyes, it puts me somewhere outside the category of conventionally handsome men. I am in the middle of my life yet almost as vain as an adolescent. Several times a day, I disarrange my lank, lifeless hair so that it does not lie unfashionably flat on my skull, but stands up as if electrified. Isn't weak enough. I mean, not weak enough. What? Not weak enough. Not weak enough, but these are not as strong. That handful of yellow men. Oh, is it yellow? I thought they were. <laughs> that handful, handful of buried of men. Buried men, yeah, buried. who understood their ground, yeah. Now, actually, that's a song 
that was very much influenced by Michael Stipe's lyrics. At the time I wrote that, I was in the Golden Palominas and had met Michael and, in fact, had to sing some of his lyrics for some of those Palomino songs, like Clustering Train. And I was very impressed with how the language resisted meaning and seemed to have all sorts of tensions within it. It wasn't like flabby nonsense. It was crafted. Those are not weak enough, but these are not as strong. That handful of buried men who understood their ground. Handy cunning wrapped around a heavy lexicon. It's weak enough to do, but it went on and on. Start it up, that's how it all began. Put the ball in wax and gear and man in red. And then he asked me, did I really believe that the human race harbors a profound death wish that manifests itself in a need for bigger and bigger calamities and that Armageddon is inevitable given that the technology for global destruction exists? And I said, well, I'm not sure, but I know what you're getting at. I knew what he was getting at. I only said that in times of protracted peace and relative prosperity, people seem bored and jaded. Calamity brings out the quality in folks. And then he asked me, did I really believe that the human race harbors a profound death wish that manifests itself in a need for bigger and bigger calamities? And then he asked me, did I really believe that the human race harbors a profound death wish? And then he asked me, did I really believe? And then he asked me. 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 me, did I really believe that the human race harbors a profound death wish? Peter Blakeveg rhymes with Eggveg, B-L-E-G-V-A-D, pronounced Blakeveg. Life might not be understandable, but stories are. To possess the art to depict your dreams, that's all I ever wanted. Stories have the power to confront you with your life. I'm actually thin, though going a bit to flab, but my self-image is of a fat voluptuary gleaming with grease, salacious. If you want to know what's really going on, you got to be patient and humble, and I'm not, so I don't know. But I can make stuff up. First you identify your characters, then you show us your problem. Then you bring on your hero, and you kick him in the balls. Then you show how he takes that kick. Does he feel sorry for himself? Never. I was waiting for a train one morning recently, a suburban station called Braintree. The sun was shining. It reminded me of days when I was a teenager at boarding school in Hertfordshire, where I met Anthony Moore. I wanted to be a Jack Kerouac railroad poet, and Anthony was my more experienced sidekick. Together we'd get drunk and haunt the Letchworth sidings, improvising derivative stanzas in a mood of anxiety and joy.
I'm a middle-aged father of two now with big worldly responsibilities. But just leave me in the sun for a minute and I become that neurasthenic ephebe again, squinting at England as if to discern a flash of Blakeian eternity behind the temporary facade of factories and foliage. It's there, God's eye, rising behind the trees. If we could just get our egos out of our line of vision, we could see it. Fragments of hippie philosophy, still adhesive after 25 years. tend to become more aggressive live. My brother Christopher and I play as a duo usually and we like to work up a sweat. He lived with her for seven years Told everyone our deepest feelings were Then one day he just up and disappeared How could he play such a trick on her? It was a real slap in the face He knew she was so afraid of scandal That he could count on her not to tell That he hadn't only left her high and dry and big with child Now he'd taken all the jewelry as well It was a real slap in the face she listened to his lies as she lay in his embrace He could only love a woman in the heat of the chase A real, a real, a real, a real Slap in the face I was opening for a big rock group in a club in Los Angeles and it was all record company executives in that place and I was playing solo with an acoustic guitar and they were talking so loud I couldn't hear myself so at one point I said, look, I know there's a million people who do what I do, hell, everybody can write songs and everybody can play guitar, so why should you listen to me? But listen, my father, he's 93 years old today and he's gone to a lot of trouble to be here tonight and he's never heard me play before. And I wonder, ladies and gentlemen, if you could lower your voices for three minutes so that you might hear this next tune written especially for you. Thank you for being so understanding. You're beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Session, um, people yeah. are going to be asking you all sorts of this. This is what's this got to do with Hans Christian Andersen? Nothing really. I was kidding. Um, on obsession is really a memory of um, erotic politics from my youth. I'm now beyond that sort of thing, but uh, so Hans has nothing to do with this. No, but. Hans Christian Andersen was a very obsessive guy, and it's a little-known fact, which I thought perhaps the listeners should know, that um, he died a virgin and was a chronic masturbator.
Okay. Peter, slap happy. Um, disbanded 1975 and regrouping 1990 for the purposes of composing, writing, acting in, directing an uh, hour-long opera for television, which should be out in 1992. That's Dagmar Krause, Anthony Moore, and myself, ladies and gentlemen, Peter Blackfoot. Peter Blackfoot rhymes with a how about the, the golden palominos because uh, the palominos how about them who were the palominos um anybody anton fear said they were but at the time i was in the band it included jack bruce michael stipe bernie warrell sid straw lisa herman chris stamey jody harris robert kidney um t-bone burnett uh, a lot of people. Uh, swim. Um, it was written to answer the question, what do you say to someone you love if they, if they do seem to have a serious illness and do seem to be face to face with the finiteness of their life, their mortality really. Just keep swimming. around you I nearly drowned you you said swim there was no other thing to grab hold of and cling to you said swim just you and me the sky and the sea you swim but what happened to Why are there two versions of the same song on this record? I mean, King... Wait, I've got that answer written down right here. Oh. <laughs> Peter's about to read the answer, folks. There are two versions of King Strut on the record. There could have been more. A song like that is very elastic, open to different interpretations. Uh, Andy and I worked it out in his attic over a couple of days, and at first it sounded like this. Roll tape. Simple brutality. Okay, right, right. Simple brutality. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> King Strut was just a baby back in 1951. His eye was well the neighborhood, they had his parents now. For negligence or cruelty, I forget which one, and the state. Well, no one ever dreamed that one day he'd become King Strut. A few, le <laughs> a few weeks later, we came up with this version. She's a few liters. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
a demo of it I made with Anthony Moore in his basement. Short of temper, highly strung, with a shadow on his lung. King strut blew off the handle if his vanity was stung. He could cut a photo of pieces using nothing but his tongue. And a technical vocabulary, fast for one so young. Throughout the noisy orphanage, his name was widely sung. King Strut. Chris Damey produced the version of Strut that opens the record. King Strut was just a baby back in 1951. King Strut, he's nobody in particular, is he? He's no special character. No, he's not. Okay. <laughs> King Strut was just a baby back in 1951. His howls woke the neighborhood. They had his parents done for negligence or cruelty. I forget which one And the state took custody of their sickly son Well, no one ever dreamed that one day he'd become King Strut Short of temper, highly strong With a shadow on his lung King Strut blew off the handle If his vanity was stung He could cut a photo of pieces Using nothing but his tongue Technical vocabulary Fast for one so young Throughout the noisy orphanage His name was widely sung King Strut Imagination like a muscle Will increase with exercise King Strut developed his By having dreams and telling lies He could describe a situation Or a piece of merchandise He could summon it from nothing Appear before your eyes Who was that masked man And why was he in disguise King Strut A man without a moral code Is just an appetite King Strut was on a diet Growing luminous by eating light He left the institution Under the cover of the night And was looking for employment Answering to Dwight The cardboard above a subway vent And one night took in the victim of a suspicious accident As dawn came up he knew the man's death was imminent The man called out a number King Strut asked him what it meant It meant the man had something valuable he wanted to present King Strut was a diamond like the crown jewel Kohenu, or a talisman empowered by an ancient conjurer a hot tip or a claim check no one knows for sure all we know is King Strut changed overnight from being poor to being an authority philanthropist Out the window 
the infirmaries in flames. But instead of crying fire, he pronounced the name of names. King Strutt. <laughs>